Okay. Um, my name is Seth Lazar. I'm a professor of philosophy at the Australian National University, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here in my um, office um, at 11 at night here in Michelago, south of Canberra, uh, with my dog at my feet and my kid sleeping next door. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I am recording this on the land of the Narago people, the traditional custodians of the land in this part of Australia. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Okay, so this is a tutorial about power in political philosophy, its nature and justification. And I just need my clicker to work. It worked a moment ago. Okay, so let's start with a bit of background, a bit of intellectual history. Um, now intellectual history is never linear. Um, any attempt to sort of overlay a pattern on the past is usually kind of factitious. Um, but there are strands and threads uh, that we can identify and trends. Um, and I just want to draw attention to one trend in particular. You know, there was a time when um, folks talking about AI and society would spend a lot of time thinking about superintelligence and existential risk. And they might think about trolley problems and autonomous vehicles. Uh, in this conference in particular, incorporating um, sort of formal principles of fairness um, into algorithmic decision-making systems, generating impossibility results from those. There obviously has been a um, seemingly unending period of developing lists of principles uh, for responsible AI. Um, and through this, there's always been a focus on regulation, governance and power, but it has become um, ever more kind of prevalent within the field. Um, think about you know, books like Algorithms of Oppression by Safia Noble, uh, the forthcoming book by Kate Crawford, Atlas of AI, um, Carissa Villis's book, Privacy is Power. All of these books have power at the, the center of their analysis of the, the place of AI in society. Um, what we don't have as much of in the field so far is some sort of uh, a pause for reflection on what we mean by power when we're talking about it, whether we mean the same things. Um, but one of the things that we know from, from social theory generally, um, including political philosophy, but not only, um, is that power can mean many, many different things. There are many different species of power, many different ways of exercising power. Um, and it's a good idea to kind of get a handle on that and to clarify it. Um, why is it good to get a sense of you know, what we mean when we're talking about power, partly because it enables better moral diagnostics. This is a really important um, tool for social critique. Um, so being clear about how we're using it and whether we're using it in the same way really matters. Uh, partly because it enables better prescriptions. It enables us to know, you know to, to, do or, to figure out what the, the path forward should be. And the reason for that is that power is not inherently wrong. Um, you know, this is a really important aspect of this debate that is often, it feels like it's missed. It feels like sometimes we use power as kind of a, a negative evaluative term, almost like just kind of booing something, like to, to name power is just to um, criticize it. Um, but, you know, sometimes power is necessary. So think about, you know, any kind of collective action problem. Um, it's pretty, almost, pretty much almost always necessary to have some measure of power um, in order to solve a collective action problem. So we need to parse the concept to tell the difference between the justified instances of power and the unjustified ones. And that's what I want to try and help you do. I'm going to draw on the tools of political philosophy, although, you know, I'm going to be, I've been reading a lot of social theory, sociology on this. Um, you know, my kind of background, my tradition is analytical political philosophy. Um, one of the things that's great about a conference like this and a topic like power um, is that every field in the social sciences has its own way of thinking about power. Um, so there's a real sort of op opportunity for some really fruitful um, interdisciplinary collaboration as we think about this. So let me give you a bit of a preview of what I'm going to talk about. And let me just um, point out as well that down at the, uh, the bottom um, of the, um, the screen there, you can see a link to get a PDF of the slides, uh, more or less latest version. Um, and that will help you follow along or sort of um, to have something you can keep for after if you find it useful. So I'm going to first talk about the nature of power, then I'm going to talk about how to justify it. Um, I'm going to go through um, a, a, my proposal, a few alternatives and objections. I'm going to spend a bunch of time talking about modalities of power and giving you examples from, um, from AI. Um, and then hopefully there'll be time to talk about justifying power. Um, if you've got questions, as you know, put them in the Slido. Um, Siska is going to help me out by copying them over to the Zoom chat so I can see it in my window here. 
Um, just put the questions in whenever you like, and I'll, I'll either sort of answer them live or I'll tell you that I've got, you know, I'm about to deal with the thing that you're asking about. Um, and I'll, I'll also try and pause um, every 30 minutes or so, every 20 minutes or so, um, and just make sure that everything's tracking okay. Um, just so you know, I can only see myself right now and only see my screen. Um, so as far as I know, I'm just talking to myself um, in this room. So um, if you want to send a, a, a chat message just to say hi and you're there and where you are, that, that might be nice too. Okay, so let's talk about what power is. The first distinction we have to draw um, is between power over and power to. So the concept of power over is that some agent or thing has power over some other agent or thing, but the latter is subject to the former in its power. Um, this is the sense in which, you know, the, um, the Australian government is in the power of the Murdoch media. For example, Rupert Murdoch has power over the Australian government. Um, you know, Facebook has power over, well, probably the Australian government too. Uh, the government has power over its citizens. That's the kind of the social relation of power. Power too is a more general concept. This is the idea that you have the power to do something. You can be empowered, you can be able. Uh, both of these concepts are, are important for social theory. Um, you might talk about distributions of power too, for example, and say, look, some, some groups are better able to get what they want than other groups. The rich have more power than the poor do, for example. Uh, but I'm not gonna focus on that. I think that power over is the social relation, that's social power. Um, and I don't think power two is sufficient for thinking about social power. Ultimately, I wanna talk about the normative evaluation of social relations, relations among people in society. Power over describes a social relation, but power two is a much more general concept. Um, the role of power two in social critique, I think can actually be adequately handled often by other concepts. So, you know, we might talk about the, the resources people have, um, their access to their ability to gain control over other people through sort of influencing the democratic process. Um, I don't think we have any other concepts that can adequately describe power over. Um, so I think that, you know, we can we can do that one and not the other. Um, it's true that I will say in a minute that power over is a sort of species of power too, in a sense, because it involves an ability, uh, but we don't really get any real insight into power over by thinking about power too. Um, so I'm gonna set power two aside for now while recognizing that it is, there is an important literature um, in social theory on power two, uh, and I'm going to concentrate on power over. That's what I'm going to mean when I talk about social power. So I'm going to give you um, my definition of power. Now, whenever you try and set out uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for anything, um, you are, um, you know, you're, you're leaving many hostages to fortune, you're susceptible to counterexamples, um, and no doubt there are plenty of counterexamples to this proposed definition. Um, but this is this is the one I'm going to offer you, and it's it's distinctive within the literature, um, although it has um, analogs. So here's my proposal: A has power over B, if and only if A is able unilaterally and without meaningful retaliation to make decisions that substantially and robustly affect B. So let's go through each step of that. So A and B. Here I'm talking about agents. I'm going to revisit this in a bit, um, and I mean this in a very general sense. It could be individuals, could be groups, could be organisations. Um, it's gonna stand in contrast with what I'll talk about later will be social structures. Um, so power, um, so think about this in the context of, you know, a public health officer who's deciding who gets the vaccine, what order people are gonna get the, the COVID-19 vaccine. That's, they have power over the people who they can affect by that decision, that significant decision. So power in my view is a potentiality. It's, uh, it comes down to being able to do this thing. So you're able to robustly affect B. Now, what do we mean by able to? That in itself is a very big philosophical literature on that. Um, I'm just going to say, broadly speaking, that there should be like realistic causal pathways by which A can affect B. Um, you could say something like, look, if A were to try, they would be pretty likely to affect B. That's a way of thinking about what able to means. I really want to emphasize this notion of unilateral decision making, unilateral authority. A is a decision maker. So think about times in your life where you've said about something, that's my decision. That's my decision to make. Or where someone who's been above you in a hierarchy said, look, it's my decision, you just have to accept it. Right? That's what power consists in, the ability to make the decision that affects the other person without them having a say in it. Right? That's the really important part of this. You know, The judge decides, or the jury decides, say, guilty or innocent, and you, the, um, you know, the person who's susceptible to that decision, you don't get to influence it. You're not one of the decision makers. And power is non-reciprocal. 
So this is what I mean by without meaningful retaliation. So you can think of unilaterally as being saying, you're the decision maker, um, and then you don't have to fear reprisals from the other party or from someone else on behalf of the other party. Um, and yeah, that could be punishment, it could be you know, revenge. Um, I mean retaliation to include all of those possible kind of reactions that might put A off um, affecting B in that way. Okay, let's go through the idea of the effects that I'm talking about. So they should be substantial effects. Well, look, this is, you know, you, you, you don't, A doesn't have power over B if A can make a sort of only a trivial difference to B's life, that's pretty obvious. One thing I want to highlight though, is that, um, you know, suppose B is a group, right? Rather than just one individual. Um, it might be the case that the effect on each individual member of B is pretty small, um, but taken in the aggregate, it's pretty significant, right? And then I think power still can consist in effects that are significant in the aggregate, but fairly small for each individual. And oftentimes the sort of decisions that are made by people who are deciding how a particular algorithm will work on social media, say, uh, might have this sort of character. You know, you might, you know, tweak a, um, an advertisement delivery um, algorithm in such a way that it sort of slightly increases click-through rates, say. Um, for each individual that you affect, it might be very small, but it could be very significant in the aggregate. Um, the next bit's probably unnecessary for a tutorial, but I wanted to say that I think that the effect should be robust, they shouldn't be accidental. And this is just to sort of rule out the possibility that, you know, A can affect B, has the ability to affect B, but only through like flukes that A can't really control. Um, you know, it should be, but at the same time, I want to leave the possibility that sometimes the fact that you can, that your mistakes can have really big impacts on other people unintentionally, that itself is evidence of the power that you have over them. So, you know, uh, um, when uh, somebody, you know, when Mark Zuckerberg decides that, um, there's going to be you know, some change in the newsfeed algorithm um, that um, doesn't, he doesn't think through all the consequences of, and that then leads to you know, a sort of increase in the spread of misinformation on the platform. Um, you know, the fact that it wasn't intended uh, doesn't mean it isn't an exercise of power. It can be power even though it's um, unintended, uh, but it should still be robust. It should be something that wasn't just a fluke. Lastly, a big difference between my definition of power and um, one, for example, by Stephen Lukes and his, um, his Power Radical View, one of the canonical um, books in this field, um, is that I think that power is not just about the ability to harm. You know, I just talk about affecting B, and that can be affecting B for, for the good or for the worse. You know, I think that um, a promotion committee has significant power over the people who are going up for promotion even though the promotion committee has the capacity to benefit rather than capacity to hurt. Um, you know, I think that benefits and harms anyway are kind of relative to a particular counterfactual baseline. They're not, it's not possible to separate them out um, in a clear way conceptually. So that's my definition. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer one objection from an alternative species of view. Um, make sure that if you have questions as we're going on, chuck them into the chat, chuck them into the Slido and Cisco will pass them over to me make sure everyone's kind of tracking okay, um, if anyone's out there. Um, and um, I've got a bunch on the slides that I've done as a PDF. I've considered a few other objections, alternate views. Um, and, uh, but in this one, I'm just gonna talk about one objection. And this is the notion that we shouldn't focus on, you know, just we shouldn't define power as being about being able to affect somebody. We should define power as being able to get somebody to do something. You know, what power is, is getting people to do stuff when they don't want to do it. You know, I've written this down to Robert Dahl, Brian Barry, actually, um, Baber, um, his view of power as well is getting people to do stuff, overcoming resistance. Um, you know, that's clearly a paradigmatic instance of power. When someone can force you to do something that you don't want to do, there's no doubt that it's a paradigmatic, paradigmatic instance. Um, the question for me is, is that, you know, adequate to get a full understanding of social power? And I think it isn't. So one reason why is I think it makes A's power over B depend too much on how resolute B is. So just suppose that, you know, two different people, one of them is particularly susceptible to being compelled by A, the other one isn't. Um, that would imply that A has more power over the first and over the other one. Um, I think that's not, you know, there, there's, there's some sense in which that's true, but it's the, if A is able to affect each of them in just the same way to the same degree, then I think in another sense, he has power over each of them to the same, to the same degree. Um, 
it implies that if A can affect B unilaterally, but doesn't care what B does as a result, then A lacks power over B. That seems wrong to me. I kind of imagine like an all powerful God who can just um, destroy the world at any moment, who created the world, um, but suppose it doesn't care what we do. A sort of all powerful but indifferent God. I think that's a completely intelligible concept, um, but um, you, wouldn't be able, you wouldn't be able to say that that God was all powerful on this view, had the, that they had power over us, even though they could end everything. Another problem with this view is that it's all about a comparison with a counterfactual baseline. That means it's about getting someone to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do. So you need to be able to say what they would have done in the absence of the powerful agent's intervention. But sometimes our power consists in the fact that we actually structure a whole kind of suite of choices for a person. And it doesn't really make sense to say what they would have done in the absence of that particular intervention. Um, so, you know, imagine someone's created a, a virtual world which, you know, kind of a second life type scenario where um, people are deeply invested in their virtual counterparts. Um, and, you know, the, the programmers of the virtual world are able to control, shape all everyone's options within that. Um, they have control over all of the options. With some particular intervention, it wouldn't make sense to say, you know, what they would do if they weren't intervene on because, you know, the only relevant counterfactual is where, like, I guess, none of the virtual world exists. Um, it's not possible to understand that kind of situation where you can't really make sense of what they would have done in the absence of the powerful agent's intervention on this sense of power. Um, so that's another reason not to um, have it. And a corollary of that is that this approach doesn't really allow for the idea that you can have power over someone while giving them more options rather than fewer. You know, and that they might even want to take. You know, the, the charismatic um, dictator might have power over the mob the mob might all enthusiastically follow what the charismatic dictator wants them to do. Um, the fact that he's not overcoming their resistance doesn't mean he doesn't have power over them. His ability to direct them, to, to shape what they do, that's the thing that gives him power. Okay, so like I said, I've got a bunch of other, um, I consider a bunch of other views um, in some slides that are at the end of the PDF. If you'd like to look at that, please go ahead. But for now, I'm gonna take my definition of power as red. So again, A has power over B, if and only if A is able unilaterally and without meaningful retaliation to make decisions that substantially and robustly affect B. And I'm now gonna talk about the modalities of power, the ways in which power can be exercised. Because as you'll see from my definition, my account is neutral over what kinds of effects um, A can have on B. You know, I talked about being able to harm or benefit um, B, so A can affect B directly. But that's not the only kind of effect. You can also affect B indirectly by shaping B's choice situations. So what do I mean by a choice situation? I mean an agent who has a set of options um, and a set of beliefs and desires and then acts within that um, choice situation in order to fulfill their desires given their beliefs. I'm assuming a sort of broadly speaking kind of rational choice account um, of choice. And you can have power over someone insofar as you can affect each of those elements. You can shape their options, you can shape their beliefs and shape their desires. Okay, so let's dig into this a little bit deeper. This picture is, um, you know, if, uh, if there's one thing that you take home from this talk, um, maybe it'll be um, this picture. I think it's quite a good way of um, kind of parsing out the different ways in which power is exercised. And I'm gonna try and sort of for each one, give you an example um, from the, Yeah, good question. So I'm just going to pause. So the question in the in the chat is um, whether your ability to um, unilaterally make decisions should also be robust. Um, and sort of reference to um, domination in Philip Pettit's schema. Um, I sort of I've punted on that. I think you can go both ways. Um, so I think you can say, look, the ability to um, could just be so A's ability to affect B um, could just be um, construed in the way that Philip Pettit does, um, where you think of it as as long as it's possible for A to affect B, um, then A has power over B. Um, or you could construe it um, probabilistically, um, you know, something like sufficient probability of success conditional on trying, so that's a conditional probability, or you could just construe it as a bare probability. So I'd fit that question into how we sort of flesh out ability um, and say that the definition I've given is neutral. Um, personally, I'm inclined to, um, the, the version I said was like, um, so not just probability, but there should be some realistic causal pathway. Um, so, you know, I want to I sort of 
um, not allow the mere possibility that we can kind of conceive of a scenario in which A could exercise, A could affect B to be sufficient for power. Um, but at the same time, so, so I want to rule that out, but at the same time, I don't want it to be kind of brutally probabilistic. Um, but yeah, cool question. Um, maybe we can follow up on that one later in case it's a bit too in the weeds for some folks. Uh, but where we are now is looking at the different modalities of power. Um, so this is a, a kind of taxonomy of schema. Um, and the goal here is to give you something that you can apply uh, and you can think about when you're thinking about, so someone has said that, you know, some particular, um, you know, algorithm or whatever um, involves power. And you want to say, okay, so let's, let's pause that out. I want to think about the particular ways in which power is being exercised. Um, this should help you kind of do that, to, to parse out the different kinds of power that are at stake. So let's start with the direct um, effects that A can have on B. Um, so here I've drawn a distinction between material and dignitary harms and benefits. You know, the basic idea here is just that, you know, if A could kill B, if A could um, cause B to lose their job, if A could cause B to get a promotion, um, these are direct um, harms and benefits. Um, and I wanted to just sort of pull apart the material and the dignity, dignitary elements of that. Um, you know, it's a, it's a fine line to draw, but the notion is just that sometimes the harm to you consists in, you know, your life going worse, your, you lose your job, or you have to pay more for a credit card than you would otherwise have to pay. Um, you know, you're, you're physically injured. These are kind of material harms and benefits. Sometimes though, the, the harm is more dignitary. It's all about, more about being shown disrespect. You know, it's the sense when you search for um, you know, and, and uh, you, you do a Google search that sort of generates racist results. And it's like, you know, that, that there are downstream kind of material um, harms to that, but there's also just a direct dignitary kind of representative harm um, that occurs with, with things like racism and with other forms of disrespect. So I wanted to draw that distinction um, in the, among the direct harms and benefits, and then sort of look at the indirect ones. So the ones mediated by choice. And there's two ways you can go here. You can go through the sort of altering options um, direction and the altering attitudes direction. So let's start with altering options. The first possibility here is that you can obstruct and enable. And obstructing, I wanna sort of take it, the limit obstructing means just making an option impossible. So removing an option from the table. Um, and sometimes it can mean just making an option more difficult. So you might think about, for example, you know, you, um, you raise a property, raise a fence around your property in order to obstruct people and make it more difficult for people to enter into your property. That's obstruction. Um, in the context of designing our digital infrastructure, you can make it possible for someone to do something or impossible. You can you can remove an option entirely. The same goes for enabling. You can create options. You can you can create a whole way of interacting with people, um, you know, from all across the world in order to to hold a conference. You can create options that didn't exist before. You're enabling things. Uh, or you can make them easier, you can make them smoother, you can, um, you know, you can uh, personalize prices in such a way that an option becomes um, easier to take. Okay. One of the things that's kind of interesting about the, um, sort of the, the way in which our options are shaped within our digital infrastructure um, is that you can sort of, yeah, you can remove things in ways that you couldn't do uh, before. So let me just give, give you a little brief sort of detour on one of the central questions of political philosophy. Um, so since Hobbes, one of the central questions of political philosophy has been, uh, what gives the state the right to coerce us? And should we, do we have an obligation to obey? Okay, who put them in charge? And, you know, why don't we do what they say? And the interesting thing about that second question, why don't we do what they say, is that it presupposes that it's possible for us to not do what they say, right? It's, it's the fact that, yeah, okay, sometimes you'll be punished or whatever, but sometimes there are situations where you can disobey the law, no one will know, um, uh, but it seems like you have a reason not to do so, why is that, right? Now, the interesting thing about, if you think about the governance of digital platforms, is that sometimes, not always, sometimes it's possible to make it the case that someone who uses a digital platform doesn't have any option to disobey. It's just, it's not even, it's not even possible for them to do the thing that might involve disobey. This isn't going to apply to everything, but it applies to some things. And it changes the nature of how we think about the legitimacy of um, platform governance. I'll come back to this later, but it's an interesting contrast between um, the, the nature of, um, of power in the digital world versus in the physical world. It's a lot easier to just completely remove options 
um, and to create new options um, when you're constructing a digital environment. This relates to the question of activating and deactivating normative commitments. Um, you know, this is effectively the same as obstructing and enabling, but what it is is just sort of, instead of you know, putting in place physical obstacles, you're putting in place moral obstacles. Instead of removing obstacles, you're, um, you're removing uh, moral obstacles. So suppose um, someone has uh, promised you that they, you know, they've, they've made a plan to meet you for, for lunch tomorrow. Um, and they call you up and they say, oh, I think I, I can't make it. Um, you know, and I suppose there's an obligation that's connected with something else. Um, you can release them from that obligation. So you can make an option that was normatively unavailable available to them by deactivating a normative commitment. You can also activate a normative commitment. You might be, you know, say you and your friend um, both work in the same area, you're, you're good buddies and the job comes up and it's one that you really, really want. You know that if your friend went for it, you'd probably get it better than you would. It would at the very least, it would kind of um, upset you or, or freak you out a bit. And he's doing really well. He didn't need this other job. Um, so you might say, hey man, just, you know, don't, don't compete with me for this job. I want to go for this job. You know, can you leave that to me? Um, then, then you're activating a normative commitment. Um, you're making that option more morally difficult for him um, by sort of drawing on your friendship in order to sort of activate a kind of a, a latent um, obligation that we have to kind of you know, do what our friends ask us if they ask us a favor um, every now and again. So next up is penalties and inducements. Um, so the idea here is that um, you know, it's similar to obstructing and enabling. Um, but what you're doing is you're, you're adding consequences to the option that the person chooses. If you choose this, then I will do this to you. Then this will happen. I will benefit you or I will, I will um, make this worse for you. And in this context, um, you know, we see the kind of the, the, how the direct effects that I described at the beginning um, kind of become useful for coercion as distinct for just sort of directly exercising power. Um, the ability to benefit and to harm people is what enables you to add sort of these beneficial or negative consequences to their options and then enables you to kind of um, induce them um, to do what you want them to do. Okay. Um, the last one in this section is menu selection and framing. Um, obviously, there's a certain amount of similarity between here, between this and um, obstructing and enabling, but it is different. This is the kind of where, where nudge economics fits, like behavioral economics, um, where, the, where it's not a matter necessarily of making things, you know, making the option objectively easier or harder. Um, it's how you present them to the person who's making the decision, the order in which you present them, what gets on the agenda and what doesn't, um, and, um, and how that then kind of activates people's cognitive biases. Um, in such a way that they um, they choose a particular um, particular option. Just as an example of this, a really silly thing. Um, some of you at the moment will be have received these surveys from the, the QS academic survey, um, and they they ask you. Um, yeah, they're doing these sort of subject rankings, um, and they ask us to um, sort of say what subjects we we have expertise in, and then the way that they sort of elicit the rankings, they basically just say. Um, you know, write down 20 universities that you think are good in philosophy. Um, and what that inevitably means is that, you know, you just, you know, sit down and, and think of 20, 20 universities in one go, like you're always going to be relying on the availability heuristic. So you're always going to be sort of skewing towards the more famous institution generally, uh, rather than making sort of a detailed individuated um, assessment. This works very nicely for our news. So I'm not going to complain about it because um, we do well, we do well under it, but it's not a very good way of kind of, um, getting at what's really the case of getting people to make genuinely rational choices. And it is a way of exercising power to sort of put people in a position where they have to rely on these cognitive biases and heuristics in ways that predictably lead them to certain kinds of results. Okay, then the next is to switch from shaping the options to shaping people's attitudes. And for this, um, you know, I was talking about um, beliefs and desires more generally, we can say, so beliefs are all kind of doxastic attitudes. It's all sort of all, all belief-like attitudes that we might have. Um, and among desires, all evaluative attitudes. So that can be not just what you want, but what you think is right, what you think is good, um, what you think you ought to do. Um, and the ways in which we can alter 
people's attitudes and that can be a matter of exercising power. It can involve doing things like kind of manipulation, sharing certain kinds of information with them and not others, um, deceiving them. You know, this is, this is where um, the, the role of, um, of newsfeed algorithms in misinformation is so important um, as it shapes what we know about the world and how we think about the world um, and can often be kind of deeply manipulative. And the same with desires, you know, you can have pernicious forms of altering people's desires where you're basically um, kind of shaping people around certain kinds of preferences that kind of serve you in the long run. So this whole sort of notion that, you know, social media changes the way in which our kind of reward centers in our brains work and leads to us kind of chasing those likes, which then leads to more engagement, which leads to more advertising revenue. Um, that's an instance of shaping people's desires. Um, but what I want to emphasize when thinking about this is that just as when talking about direct um, forms of power, you know, I emphasize that you can harm or you can benefit. Um, the same is true when it comes to altering people's attitudes and they can still constitute an exercise of power. So I think that actually, you know, helping people to form true beliefs by showing them the truth, you know, um, that actually can constitute a significant type of power. Helping people to align their first order and their second order desires. Um, that too is a significant kind of power. Now by that, I mean, so your first order desires are what you want. Your second order desires are what you want to want. Most of us struggle to, to match these two things up. Um, sometimes algorithmic systems can really help you do that. Like I, I'm one of the reasons I'm standing, not the only reason, partly it's because I want to stay, up, uh, stay awake. Um, but also uh, one of the reasons I'm standing is because my watch will ping me every, um, every hour to make sure that I'm standing. Um, and you know, one of the things that using this watch has done is it's helped me align my first order desires, what I, what I want in a moment with my second order desires. I want to want things that are healthy and that keep me fit. Um, and that is actually a way in which the people who have designed my, my watch um, do exercise a kind of power in my life. Uh, and I wanna emphasize that it's not just about, power is not just about um, the, the kind of the manipulation side of this. It can also be about um, the sort of more beneficial side, more paternalistic benign side. You know, someone psychiatrist could have significant power over them insofar as they've really helped them um, come to um, sort of understand their desires and their beliefs better. Okay, so I'm going to pause. I've got a question um, in the in the chat, so I'm going to read that. Okay, so the question is: um, dignitary harm or benefit seems nebulous. Could dignitary be considered a subset or cause of material, insofar as it only really matters if it cascades to material effect? So. Um, I guess I don't agree with this. I think that um, the, the fact of disrespect is a sort of meaningful and distinct aspect of the wrong that we do in any given case. And I think one way to sort of look at that is to think um, about the difference between, if you like, um, you know, an intended and an accidental harm. Okay, it's just, just one case where it seems like this makes a difference. So you can suffer exactly the same material harm in the sense that um, you, know, um, you, you suffer the same sort of physical loss. Um, but it might be that one of them is done intentionally. The person really meant you to be harmed. They wanted it to be you um, and they wanted you to suffer that harm. And in the other case, it's an accident, right? Um, and so my view is that the, the fact that they actually wanted you to be the one to suffer that harm, they wanted you to suffer that harm, constitutes a species of disrespect um, that in itself um, makes their action worse um, than it would be um, in the absence of that intention. Now, I've called this a harm benefit in order to keep the sort of language simple. You know, I think it'd be, um, it'd be perfectly sensible to say that disrespect is not actually a harm or a benefit itself. Um, but that's the thing I'm trying to capture with this notion. Um, and I don't think it's nebulous. I mean, I do think that some people don't believe that that sort of thing makes a difference. You know, and they say, um, taking the context of the ethics of war, um, so-called collateral killing is just as bad as intentional killing. Um, but at the same time, obviously, lots of people don't think that. The international laws of war are constructed so as not to think that. Um, often it seems like we really do care about kind of what the attitudes are of people towards us. Um, and I think that shows up a lot in the context of a lot of the big criticisms of um, the big tech companies, um, you know, the algorithms of oppression, the, the way in which there are, you know, representational harms as well as what are called allocative harms in that context um, that are really felt very keenly by people who are adversely affected by them. Um, so I wouldn't say that they only matter insofar as they cascade to material effect, 
Although I would agree that in general, they're going to be very closely imbricated with one another. Um, and you're not likely to get sort of pure cases of um, either on their own. And that's worth saying in general. So I've just given you this sort of this, this um, taxonomy of different ways in which power can be exercised. But it's really important to stress that um, in any given instance, you're going to see a bunch of these kind of interacting and being overlaid on one another at the same time. Okay. Do, um, do put in any other questions if you have them. I'm just going to check my notes, make sure I've got everything on this, um, on this slide. Yeah. Yeah, I think on the menu selection and framing side, one thing that I didn't say that I wanted to is that search is just the perfect example of this kind of nudging. You know, and here it's just things like, you know, what do you put in the top of the at the top of the ranking? You know, how much text do you show with um, you know, with a uh, um, search engine optimization? You know, how much? What do you put above the fold? What do you put in the summary? These things are are really very much all about designing people's choice architectures, um, and the the power to shape that can be tremendously important. And that was an example I wanted to use there. Okay, so that's the modalities of power. Um, I wanna pause now just to make a comment um, about something that I've sort of, the way in which I've chosen to represent this, which I think um, I wanna just sort of amend slightly. Okay, because now that we've seen the kind of the ways in which power is exercised, I think it's pretty plausible um, that quite often, um, just the same kinds of things are done, but they're not done by people. What you have instead is you have lots of people acting together in ways unintentional or intentional. They generate social structures and social structures exercise power in the ways that I've described. So what do I mean by a social structure? Let's just pause to talk about that. Um, so here I mean formal and informal, by that I mean, you know, sort of codified or uncodified. Um, objects created through social interaction, which define social roles and social relations um, and reliably reproduce patterned outcomes for those affected by them. So, you know, you might think of um, some specific institution like the, uh, you know, the, 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 the government has a parliament or whatever, uh, or you might think of things like the family um, or even uh, race and gender, all of being social structures. Um, in this context, when you look at, when we think about the social relation of power, it's quite natural to think that, um, you know, quite often, you know, this particular A, this particular B, doesn't really make that much difference. If this guy wasn't in power, if this rich, rich white guy wasn't in power, then another rich guy, white guy would be. Um, the individual is kind of epiphenomenal. Uh, the structure creates these positions of rich white guy who has power um, and other folks who don't. Um, and, you know, to sort of, focus on the agent is kind of to, to miss the point as far as social analysis goes. Um, so I think this is partly partly true. It's worth sort of remembering. I think the social stru structures give us a lens to understand oppression. Um, obviously the way in which they exercise power, they can do all of these modalities of power. They wouldn't quite meet my definition because you can retaliate against them. They don't make decisions. Um, the modalities are the same. Um, but I think it's worth keeping them in mind when you think about power alongside the more agenty stuff that I've talked about. And one of the reasons for that is that I think that the whole kind of, I mean, algorithms in particular, but the, the creation of our digital infrastructure in general um, lends a really interesting kind of new light on the, the, the structure agency um, discussion. Um, and this is because you know, typically, like I said before, you know, the, the ways in which so social structures are kind of emergent, they just come up out of the stuff that we do, we don't necessarily intend to create them, we might intend to create little bits, but the, the overarching whole, you know, no one intentionally created um, gender, right, um, or race, it's just something that emerges through certain practices over time. What's interesting about our digital infrastructure is that we do intentionally create it, you know, we may, you know, rely on um, sort of algorithms and kind of a form of generative design to sort of do things in ways that we're not in control of every moment. Um, but there is this sort of translation from the social world into the digital world, which is mediated through an agent. And that does actually give us um, a significant degree of control over how those social structures get reproduced um, digitally. An interesting example of this is if you think about um, the, 
criticisms made by Safia Noble and others of, uh, of search and sort of racist search, search results kind of in the early, um, early tens, um, you know, that was you know, presented as just the sort of you know, the racist world being translated into the racist results on, on Google search. Um, and, you know, just uh, you know, no agency involved there. And obviously what we've seen over the last um, 10 years um, is that um, you know that Google is intervening in search much more to try and anticipate these kinds of problems and to restructure the world that we um, encounter through Google search in a way that is more in accordance with our values. Um, so that's just an example of the way in which um, when you're designing digital infrastructure, you're actually able to intervene on social structures in a way um, that you um, arguably aren't when you're sort of acting in the world. So before I go on, let me just pause to take a question. Um, so someone, uh, Ted Pedersen has raised this question about the difference between, re between retaliation and resistance. Um, so whether there's a difference between resisting a decision versus retaliating, uh, resistance feels different, but I'm not sure I can articulate it, he says. Um, so yeah, this is a really good, really good point. I mean, I'll hopefully get to this a bit when I think about the ways in which we can legitimate and limit power um, and the role that kind of accountability and reaction kind of plays to that. Um, you know, I do think that the, the, the notion of retaliation basically is that um, is someone going to do something to A that is going to give A pause and make A not want to go ahead and affect B in this way? So I would think of resistance as being, it certainly can reach a point where that kind of happens, where you have the balance of power shift um, and the, if you like, the people are able to kind of push back sufficiently well to, to disempower the powerful. Um, but sort of in general, unless they're able to actually kind of translate that resistance into, um, into effectively threats that make A um, demur from using, from affecting B, um, then I would think that would be different from um, retaliation. Um, and yeah, you know, I said meaningful retaliation, that's kind of what I meant by that. So hopefully that helps Ted. Um, okay. One thing that we're really gonna wanna do with our concept of power is quantify it, right? This is gonna be important um, because we're gonna to need to um, determine which power relations are more important than which other power relations. Political scientists are very pessimistic um, about the ability um, to, um, uh, I'll come back. So Sarah's just asked a question, I'll come back to that, yeah. Um, so this question is really like, so political scientists don't think you can measure power, it's really too hard. I think you can make very good intuitive comparisons and there are these dimensions of power and you know, if, if you max out all the dimensions, then you've got a lot of power and you don't necessarily need to be able to commensurate all the different dimensions to one another. Just pausing to say what I mean by an agent. I just mean by someone acting in the world, something that can act in the world, that can make decisions. Um, it's a very loose and general. Um, you know, um, very loose and general um, kind of notion of what an agent is. Just the ability to make decisions is a defining feature. So, you know, I as a person, I'm an agent. Uh, my university can constitute an agent, an agent in this sense. Um, the state can constitute an agent, a particular company. Um, so in the chat, Zachary Lipton asked whether society, um, or if not one particular individual, does have some intent agency in creating race, and more so than we tend to acknowledge. Um, I think that the relationship between structure and agency in that context is, is deeply complex. Um, usually the sort of uh, it's, I don't know if it's a bit Weasley, but usually the sense that people come to is that, you know, structures, obviously, they aren't, they aren't um, things in the world that we have no responsibility for. You know, they create these positions, but we sustain them by participating in those positions, by accepting the benefits that come with them, by not changing them. Um, so it's certainly true that especially people who are in positions of power within those structures do sustain and create them um, and perpetuate them. Um, Iris Marion Young's book, Responsibility for Justice, would be a good one to read there um, on that topic. Okay, so the dimensions of power. So concentration. Um, this is a simple one, it's just a ratio. How many people have you got power over versus how many people have the power? Um, you know, how few are the A's and how many are the B's? Um, degree. So what, how big are the effects on the B's? Um, you know, if, if A can kill B, um, then, you know, yeah, that's, that's a pretty big effect, pretty significant degree of power. Um, if A can make it the case that B sees a few more advertisements that are a little bit more personalized than would otherwise be true, well, for each individual B, that may be a fairly trivial difference. In the aggregate, it could be a pretty significant difference. And I do want to emphasize that, 
you know, a, a significant degree of power can involve small effects on lots of people. And then scope. So over how big a set of choices can A affect B? And, you know, this is obviously we don't just want, we can't really quantify kind of number of choices in any meaningful way. And we want to think about how important or significant are the choices in that set. Like can A control like all of B's important life decisions, like who B marries, what job B gets, where B lives? Um, you know, that, that's an important set of life decisions. That's a significant degree of power to be able to control each of those um, versus, um, you know, it could be you can affect like zillions of choices, but each of them is relatively trivial. Um, so just as a sort of a way of applying this, think about Mark Zuckerberg and Mark Zuckerberg's power over the users of Facebook, uh, a lot of bees, um, however many billion people use Facebook and, and he's one guy. So very significant concentration of power. Degree of power, this is interesting. Um, we might say that for most people, the effects of Mark Zuckerberg's decisions over, you know, how the newsfeed algorithm works, how they see adverts, um, how they're able to interact with their friends and family, um, you know, might not be that kind of that significant. In the aggregate, for 2 billion people, it makes a big difference. And obviously sometimes for some people, you know, if the newsfeed algorithm is promoting content that ultimately leads to them believing in QAnon and becoming completely estranged from their family, um, then that's a pretty significant degree of power. And then the scope of choices, you know, as you see these platforms kind of expand and expand and affect broader and broader parts of our lives, you see co correspondingly their degree of power increase. Um, so when it's just a few students sort of um, checking one, one another out on the Facebook, it's one thing when it's got like a marketplace, when it's got, you know, devices that um, kind of monitor you in your home, when it's got sort of the ways in which children communicate with their, um, with their grandparents, um, then it starts to become more significant. Okay, so that is almost the, um, the sort of expository, descriptive kind of uh, analytical side about what power is. I wanted to do one last bit on the purposes of power. This is really quick. Um, I just wanted to distinguish between a couple of things. Like, so on the one hand, you can use power to benefit the person who you have power over. That's paternalism. That's kind of benign. It's not necessarily problematic, but you're trying to benefit the person you have power over. That's the kind of power that I have over my, my son in the room next door, my nine-year-old. Um, I have power of him in such a way that I'm trying to benefit him. Um, you can also use power in order to benefit others, right? To use power over B to benefit people who aren't B. I'll call that extraction, the other one guidance. I'm gonna really focus on governance. This is, I've got a specific definition of this. Um, making, implementing and enforcing the constitutive rules of an institution. That's kind of complicated. I'd, I'd like you to just think of it, an intuitive sense of governance in the way that the state governs the people. Facebook governs the, the people who use its platform. Um, the Apple governs the people who use the app store, the businesses that use the app store. Um, these sense of government, like making and enforcing rules um, and delivering services um, as part of an institution. That's what I wanna focus on. I'm not gonna talk about moral enforcement. That's just something I put in there for completeness. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna switch and I'm gonna start talking about um, the justification of power. Um, and I'm gonna focus on governance. So we're at, we're at the sort of notional halfway point, although the second half is not going to take as long as the first half. Um, so again, um, I'd like, please do put in your questions. Um, I may have advertised a break at some point, I don't know, but the, because I can't see anybody um, besides myself, I'm just going to sort of pause for a moment, see if there are any questions and otherwise press on. By the way, I haven't put in a um, credit, I just forgot on the slides. The artist here is, uh, for all the backgrounds of the slides, is called Dario Veruari. Um, and they're very cool, kind of like it's generative art. So it's a combination of the artist and the um, uh, and an algorithm, which I like. Okay, so I'm gonna press on. So why is power presumptively morally problematic? Well, because um, on a certain view of the world, uh, we are all, uh, we're all born free and equal. So this is a sort of broadly, uh, broadly speaking, this is a, a liberal egalitarianism, which, which I subscribe to. Um, maybe you do too. Um, the notion that we have natural freedom and equality, and that's something that needs to be respected and accommodated within our institutions. And the fact is that the power of some over others is presumptively an affront to our basic freedom and equality. So 
First, um, equality. A has power over B. Um, a can affect B in ways that B cannot affect A. So that means that they can't really have egalitarian social relations. They're not on an equal footing. So not good from the perspective of equality um, and not good from the perspective of freedom. A's power over B can constrain B's options and B's ability to choose freely among them. If A is manipulating B, making it the case that you know, B doesn't know what to believe and is, is um, acting irrationally because of how A has controlled B's, B's um, choice situation and their beliefs, their evidence, then um, A is making B um, unfree. Interestingly, um, I'll just sort of go on to this next point in a moment. Interestingly, it's, it was funny to me to sort of realize that power is kind of necessarily antithetical to equality, uh, but not necessarily antithetical to freedom. I had thought that it would be um, necessarily antithetical to freedom, but I think that sometimes power can be uh, consistent with enhancing people's freedom. Um, but I also want to stress that um, power over the bees over a group can also be in tension with their collective freedom. Um, so here I mean that, so look, suppose A controls the instantiation of digital counterparts of really important social, st social structures um, that the bees kind of operate within. So, you know, again, just to use uh, Facebook as the whipping boy, um, just through designing a product that people come to really um, enjoy and use, you get to kind of exert a significant influence over how families communicate with one another, how friend groups communicate with one another. It becomes a really important part of people's lives. Um, and each individual person affected by it might not have any claim to be able to kind of control the, the terms of engagement on this, um, on this platform. Um, but there is a pretty strong um, ground for collective self-determination over the social structures that are significant as part of our lives. We have a, a, a right, maybe an obligation to shape the shared terms of our social existence. Um, and that can be antithetical to the kind of power of someone who creates um, the digital infrastructure that we inhabit in this way. So, you know, it's not just a matter of power being in tension with individual freedom, it can also be in tension with collective self-determination. But like I said, it's also important um, to note that sometimes power can um, give you more options, better information, enable you to act in ways that are correspondent with the truth and with your true desires. Um, so power and freedom are not necessarily opposed and power is not necessarily bad. And that's the big um, sort of missing piece here. You know, so sometimes what you got to do is you got to eradicate power relations. Okay, just that can induce equality, it can enhance freedom. But sometimes in order to actually enable people to exist on an equal social plane, in order to enable people to act freely, you need to have power in place. Trivially speaking, this can be a matter of, um, you know, in order to stop the strong preying on the weak, you need to have a powerful agent that's going to protect the weak. Right, so that's um, that's kind of inevitable. Um, anything that involves collective action, collective action problems, um, you know, solutions to those are going to rely on some having power to others. We're going to need power, essentially, for governance, especially for the governance of the institutions that exist in order to realise free and egalitarian social relations. So the state, state-like entity. Um, so the question is not going to be like how do we eradicate power relations. Um, but rather it's going to be what can make the possession and exercise of power just or, you know, all things considered morally permissible. So that's what we're going to talk about. And what I'm going to do is less, um, you know, this will sort of depend on time, but I'm, I'm, I'm less going to go through all of the kind of, well, I mean, look, it would be a whole course in political philosophy to think about what it is that makes the exercise of power morally permissible. Um, what I want to do is talk about some kind of distinctions that you can draw in order to help you think through this, um, this problem and this question. So you can kind of populate those distinctions later as you, as you think more about them. Okay, so I wanna give you this distinction between justification and legitimacy, or if you like, substantive justification and procedural legitimacy. Uh, a paper that I really like on this, I've put in the references at the end, um, by Ajon Simmons called Justification Legitimacy. Um, so first there's a question of substantive justification. 
if A is using power over B and the, the goal is, you know, is governance is something worthwhile, um, the question is, is A using its power to help B make morally justified choices? Right? Is A enforcing what B ought to do anyway? And that would be substantive justification. Is A using power to, justif to, to advance or protect a morally justified institution? You know, so there could be a case in which um, you know, this particular instance um, doesn't involve getting B to make a morally justified choice, but it's necessary in order to preserve an overall justified institution. Is the actual content of A's directive itself morally justified? This is part of the substantive justification question. And this is always important. It's always, it's often the first and most important question. Um, but it's not the only question you can ask about the exercise of power. The other type of question focuses on procedural legitimacy. So it may be the case that, um, you know, power that is aimed at justified ends may, you know, may on balance advance freedom and equality, but that doesn't address the question of how the exercise of power itself undermines freedom and equality. You could think about power as being like, yeah, it involves, you know, it is a, um, it involves a cost to freedom and equality, but that's outweighed by the benefits. Um, but there's a question about how big that cost should be and how we can minimize that. And that's the question of legitimacy. And the idea is that if power is exercised legitimately, then it doesn't actually create unequal social relations. Um, and it limits individual freedom um, only in ways that ultimately realize collective freedom. And that's really the key thing about legitimacy is that it's about limits, about limiting power. Um, so legitimate power is limited power. And that's something I'd really like you to kind of um, take home from this. And so the distinction between justification and legitimacy enables you to see um, that um, you can have an illegitimate authority that issues a justified directive. So, you know, it may be that um, uh, an authoritarian dictatorship handles the, um, the pandemic really well, gets people to do all the things that they need to do in order to reduce um, transmission of the, of the virus. Um, and you can have a legitimate authority that issues unjustified directives. So, you know, a vibrant democracy that um, can't manage to sustain a mask mandate. Um, these things are, you know, they don't necessarily travel together. Yeah, okay, so I really wanna emphasize that idea about limited power. Um, oh, funny. Um, someone just commented that uh, uh, from Iran, they're struggling to watch the tutorial because YouTube is banned there. Um, so yes, there you go, power and political philosophy. Um, that's an example, that's a pretty sort of salient example of removing options, making options more difficult. Yeah, often, oftentimes that's one of the interesting things, isn't it? Like you, you remove an option, but if you can get a VPN to work, um, it's really just about, it's just a matter of it being harder. But I hope that you manage, um, I hope that you manage to access the content somehow. Um, yeah, so my big thing on this slide was I wanted to emphasize this notion of limiting power. This kind of goes back to the, the point about resistance that I think it was Ted made earlier. Um, the notion is really that um, when we're able to actually, you know, to, when we are collectively able to restrict the power of those who have power over us, um, even if they have power over us individually, we collectively have power over them. That's kind of the, the best you can hope for in this scenario. That's the, the goal of a legitimate state. So I'm not gonna try and um, make any further headway on what makes the exercise of power substantively justified. Um, I can't illuminate it very well in passing. Um, it's just the whole of political, the whole theory of justice basically. But I do wanna to talk to you about procedural legitimacy because I want to introduce you to these three different dimensions of that question. What I'm calling standing, process, and redress. They have a sort of quasi-temporal feel to them. Um, you know, one of them is about sort of what puts, what, um, like why you, why do you get to, to say that, to, put, um, to, to issue the commands? Next, about how the commands are issued. And then last, it's about what happens subsequently. So let's go through these, um, these three things, starting out with standing. So anybody who has watched um, any uh, post-apocalyptic um, sci-fi of which I am a, a sort of tragic fan um, will know that the first question that you ask in your, you know, after the Cylons have wiped out the human race um, and you're trying to sort of uh, rebuild society or to evade them um, is who put you in charge? Um, so why should the Secretary of State for Education be, uh, be the president, right? Um, in the Battlestar Galactic context. I also just watched The Stand, which oh, 
that really wasn't worth it. Um, but that is a similar question right at the beginning. The first question is, who put you in charge? Why should you be the one to wield power? This is the question of standing. And uh, in a lot of ways, when asked of states, this really is the central question of political philosophy, um, you know, from, from Hobbes onwards, really. It's why should those people get to control, um, to monopolize the legitimate use of force? Why should we do what they say? Um, the kind of, the goal that you get in political philosophy, the idea of what gives standing the, the best archetype is that everyone who's subject to an authority consents to that authority's power. Um, now, an interesting sidebar here is that um, this approach only makes sense in a situation where you couldn't possibly have like a collective action problem. Um, you know, if it's a situation where I know that as long as 20% of other people consent, then my consent or dissent is going to be meaningless, um, then that's not a situation where individual consent is meaningless, meaningful at all, uh, and it wouldn't legitimate power. Um, I say this because this is an issue to do with the, um, you know, the, the power that derives from access to, to data um, and sort of the ability to make inferences about people from that data. And the fact that we try to legitimate that power, we try to give the platform the standing to exercise it um, through individual consent. Um, but, you know, the effects for you are no different um, if you, as long as enough other people consent, some small amount, um, the effects for you are no different. So whether you consent or not becomes meaningless. So consent is not a great basis for standing. Um, so we tend to reach for alternatives. Um, you know, again, this is a big field of political philosophy. Um, you know, my view is that the, the way to think about standing is that it has to come down to democratic authority and collective self-determination. Um, and the idea then is that the folks who have power are authorized um, by us collectively um, to, uh, to act on our behalf. So, you know, power in this sense is fundamentally a delegation. The ultimate power lies with the people. We delegate to a particular set of rulers at a given time, um, but we have power over them and their standing is grounded in, in that fact. It's, it's sort of, it's transitively derived from our kind of collective power over ourselves. Um, this is why um, democracy is a better term for what we have than polyarchy. This is a, a point, a sort of a bit of a niche political science point, um, but Robert Dahl is political scientist talking about polyarchy, the notion that democracies weren't really democracies. There were situations where um, many people ruled, um, um, whereas actually, you know, in, in most of our countries, actually a fairly small number of people actually do the ruling. They have um, the power of government, um, but the notion is that we have the power to boot them out in the event that they're not doing what we want them to do. So we're not governing as the policy, we're not engaged in the business of governance, um, but we do have power. We do have the, it's the, you know, the democracy, the strength of the people. We do have the power to, um, to boot them out if they aren't um, acting satisfactorily. That I think is the, the best hope for um, where kind of standing can come from. Um, now, one of the things that is really interesting about thinking about AI in general, um, <laughs> 10 favorite post-apocalyptic post sci-fi movies. Yeah, also books. Also not necessarily just post-apocalypse. Uh, post the um, Red Mars, I think, is brilliant for a kind of constitutional convention. Um, but one of the things I think is super interesting um, about this, uh, thinking about digital infrastructure is that political philosophy has really only considered the standing of states. Um, and what we have um, now is we, we are governed, you know, in our sort of physical lives. Yeah, we're still governed by states, obviously. Um, but we spend more and more time within digital platforms that exercise an increasing influence over our lives. Um, and this question of what, where they get standing from um, is, um, is a really open one um, and one that we haven't really sort of thought through. We know that consent is no good. Um, it seems as though any kind of democratic author authorization is unlikely to be achieved. Um, so where then does their standing come from? That I think is a really important, um, important question. So just a quick um, pause to answer a question from Maria uh, Sente. Um, so what's the relation between ethics and power? Um, uh, okay, so I, I look, this is for a philosopher, um, when we think of ethics, we think of the whole sort of range of normative questions. Um, so for us, um, ethics is just the topic of, you know, moral and political philosophy. So power is sort of part of thinking about that. Um, 
Uh, when we think about how we use the concept ethics kind of in well, not necessarily just in academic circles and you think about kind of individual responsibilities, um, you know, I would think that um, when we when we look at power generally, we're thinking about social relations. And in that context, um, we tend to sort of it's place less emphasis on the, the choices that individuals make um, and more, again, on that point about social structures and how social structures put people into certain positions of power. Um, certainly, it should be the case that those who have power have kind of responsibilities that are generated from that. So that's part of the um, how kind of ethics gets translated and brought out. Um, but um, there's certainly also a way in which ethics as a sort of way of looking at um, an area, and especially a way of looking at a topic um, like uh, AI can lead one to think of sort of, you know, the the ethical thing to do is you're, you're trying to do the right thing in a particular situation you're not necessarily thinking about analyzing the the relations of power in which you stand so this is a, just a broad roundabout way of saying that sometimes focusing on ethics as a concept can lead us to think too little about power um, that's not because of the nature of ethics as a concept it's because of a certain kind of um, practice that we're used to Yeah, great. So someone, um, Vishnish Sengupta has said, there's a power imbalance between AI developers and designers and the individuals that experience ne negative consequences. How do we get AI developers to consciously recognize this power imbalance and change their processes and products accordingly? That's a really great point. And I think that you can sort of look at each of the, each of the things that I'm talking about in the context of legitimacy. Um, you can look at it through you know, any, any given sort of social power relations. And I think that the, the development of AI um, raises lots of really interesting questions of power. So you're focusing this in this case on the, the developers and designers versus the people who are affected. Um, that's clearly really important. Um, I think also, I mean, look, the infrastructure of AI research um, is very significantly beholden to the digital platforms whose standing we're just talking about. I saw in the news today that um, the factors um, decided not to take any uh, to, to sort of pause its relationship with Google um, in terms of funding. Um, but, you know, fact is that AI research as a whole is very significantly funded by these companies. Um, and as we've seen this year, um, they are willing to penalize researchers whose views they find um, incongenial. Um, you know, that's, they're, they're not sort of entertaining the idea of sort of academic freedom in the context of, um, of research. This is very much a kind of naked exercise of power. Um, and I think that it's really important to look at the whole kind of AI ecosystem through the lens of power and to think about, you know, under what circumstances the power that's being exercised kind of justified. The fact is, Ushnish, um, you know, there's always gonna be a power imbalance between AI developers um, and, uh, and designers on the one hand and the people who are affected on the other hand. If you're designing tools that are gonna significantly affect people's lives, then you're gonna have a significant amount of power. So the question is, how do you use that power responsibly? And how do we also create um, the right sort of processes to ensure that you have the standing to do that, that you do so in the right way, is what I'm gonna come to in the next, and that there is accountability post facto. So let me get on to that. Um, yeah, so as far as the, um, the digital platform stuff goes, um, the basic point I was making before is that just, if a social institution is central to our lives, our ability to collectively shape its contours becomes a precondition for our enjoying collective freedom. Um, so the question of standing is gonna to have to be answered um, for digital platforms as well as for, um, for our sort of, uh, our states. Um, so here I wanna point out a bit of a shortcoming of political philosophy. Um, the next question is about process, how power is exercised. Um, you might think about this a little bit in terms of the transparency part of the fairness accountability transparency um, kind of title. Um, Political philosophers often just focus on that question about standing, like you know, this, the all powerful state, how do they get to be in power? But the question of how power is exercised is just as important as by whom. Um, and this is where all of these issues to do with legitimate process and procedural justice come in. Um, this is an area of, um, uh, you know, in, in the law, this is administrative law covers this area significantly. Um, you know, legitimate process is about limiting the power of the powerful, making sure that they have to follow certain rules. They can't just kind of make, make decisions on a whim. Um, there are boundaries to what they can do. Um, this is where due process is important. You know, and this is partly about ensuring a kind of certain, certain kind of equal treatment. It's also about ensuring a sort of 
reduction in the degree to which power um, um, uh, undermines individual freedom. Okay, so I said that. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a great piece of work to be done on the moral foundations of administrative law. Um, it's not an area that political philosophers have discussed much. The legal philosophers who have looked at it have looked at it in a sort of um, how to justify it as law kind of way rather than its broader foundations. I think it's really important. I think it's really important to think about AI and power because the big question that a lot of us have been asking is, you know, how does the use of algorithms in the exercise of power make it harder to meet these kind of procedural standards? So anybody who's been writing about explainability, interpretability, these sort of topics, you know, one of the reasons why that's such an animating question is that it just seems really hard to see how, you know, uh, you know, say a government agency or even a, even a digital platform can make a decision that has real significance for people and exercise of power um, on the basis of uh, a machine learning system that they can't adequately interpret or explain. Um, there is a sort of a basic principle of procedural justice that you should be able to um, explain well, that you should be able to give reasons that justify your decision. Um, you know, there's another basic principle that only those who are properly authorized to do so should make the rules and regulations that apply to the conduct of those who are subject to them. Um, and that's something as well that can be completely messed up by the, uh, you know, the outsourcing of um, governance to, um, to tech companies by, uh, by states. Um, inevitably, in operationalizing any particular kind of um, legal rule, you end up precisifying it, and so you end up writing the law, um, but you may not be authorized to do so. It's a point that Daniel Citron made in a paper in 2009 um, about sort of much more um, kind of old fashioned uh, algorithmic governance, and it applies with equal force now. One, one big question about this sort of process, um, and it's one that has really animated a lot of the AI ethics community, um, though they maybe haven't seen it in this way. Um, is that, you know, the, um, there are questions about kind of for what reasons you're exercising power, for what values in, in the service of what values power is being exercised um, that are really important um, in the sense that we disagree about evaluative questions. Um, we disagree pretty vehemently. Um, so why is it the case that one set of values gets to be kind of um, incorporated into, um, into our you know, the, the governance decisions that apply to us. That is a, a process question effectively. Um, and it's, it, that is a topic that has been discussed a lot in political philosophy and from which there could be a lot of um, uh, useful lessons drawn for when folks start talking, you know, start, start worrying like whose values are gonna get implemented in AI systems. Um, you know, when, when we're talking about governance, this is really gonna be, um, uh, that's gonna be the literature that you wanna draw. The literature on, broadly speaking, um, uh, political decision making in the context of moral disagreement. Uh, one thing that I think is important is that sometimes computer scientists see this question as kind of an epistemic one, the whose values question as an epistemic one, like how do we know um, which set of values to incorporate? Um, it's important to realize, I think, that it's much more a political question. It's about how do we, how do we decide which values we're going to incorporate? By what process are we going to ensure that we properly respect the different perspectives of different people that are affected by these systems? Pausing. Okay. Um, so could we consider, so Petros Terzis asks, could we consider Facebook's oversight board tasked to supervise takedown decisions of users' content as a demonstration of power for gaining um, procedural legitimacy? So certainly I think that the goal there is to, um, is to generate a sense of legitimacy and to, to do so by focusing on um, these sort of procedural questions. So I absolutely agree that that's the intention. Um, now, um, you know, I think that there certainly is, uh, with respect to their very limited remit, I, I'm sure that they will do a sort of a conscientious job. Um, I think, you know, you see the, the, the problem there with the idea of sort of generating your own structures of accountability. You decide what it's going to apply to. Um, I think the reason why, you know, in, in the context of states, um, we collectively, you know, over the course of a series of revolutions, perhaps, tell those in power, you know, what are going to be the limits of their power and how we're going to restrict them. Um, that's kind of the way things should be. It shouldn't be that the powerful get to decide where they will be constrained. It should be that those subject to the power um, get to decide what the limits of that power will be. Um, but certainly that's the objective. Um, taking a question from Henrik Junkowitz. Um, 
So aren't decision makers in other fields of engineering always making decisions about systems they don't understand? For example, regulating airplanes or medical imaging devices. Why is AI different? Yeah, so the, the, the issue would be, um, is are you using an algorithmic system in order to make a decision that significantly affects people's lives? So that's the, that's the situation where you really need to know um, what the reasons are for the decision. And if the, if the reason for the decision is ultimately because the model said so, um, and we can't go beyond that, um, then that's not, an that's not an adequate justification. So Henrik, it really depends on the use to which the um, AI system is being put rather than on the fact that it's AI. Okay, so the last point, which um, as you know, uh, people at the Fairness Accountability and Transparency um, uh, Conference, you'll all have thought of, I'm sure, um, is that uh, we need to have redress, right? So for the procedures to have any purchase, uh, for democratic authorization to genuinely ground the state's claim to authority, there must be accountability. This happened, this should happen at the individual level. So if you remember my sort of my, my vaccine official, if the person deciding who gets the vaccine um, exceeds the boundaries of their authority and puts their mate up the up the queue, um, then that's um, there needs to be accountability, there needs to be redress. You know, we need to not only state that this is the limit of your power, but actually enact that. But the same is true for governments. If your government is making these decisions um, and they do so wrongly, you need to be able to boot them out. This is one of the things um, I wrote about in the context of um, the whole COVID contact tracing apps, exposure notification apps. Um, I was very uncomfortable about the fact that ultimately with those apps, the decision over how to weigh privacy and public health, going back to that point about how to sort of um, act under normative disagreement, was made by Apple and Google rather than by democratically elected governments. Not to say that I didn't think they made the right decision. It looked to me like you know, it could well have been a justified decision to weigh privacy and public health in the way that they did. But I still thought that it should have been a decision that was made in our case by the Australian government. Um, so it looked to me like an example of justification without legitimacy. And one of the reasons why it lacked legitimacy is because if we discover that we could have you know, save more lives by using, um, by, by configuring things the other way. We don't have any way of getting rid of the people who made the bad decision if it's Apple and Google's executives. Um, and that's the reason why you'd prefer in general for those sort of decisions to be made by democratic governments because you can get rid of them um, um, in the event. So yeah, these are the, this, this is basically the notion that um, redress is about enforcing limitations on the power of the powerful. Um, I've got an open question there about whether to think this is about limiting the state's power or making it permissible. That's kind of a conceptual question I don't need to go through. Yeah, I've said that. All right, so we've got seven minutes left. I wanna make sure that, so please put in your questions. I'm gonna just kind of recap. Um, my goal here is that if you only remember this slide, um, you'll have sort of most of the important content from the, um, from the talk. Um, so while I just sort of review what we've talked about, if you have any questions, just whack them in and um, Cisco pass them on to me. So I gave you my definition of power. A has power over B if and only if A is able unilaterally and without meaningful retaliation to make decisions that substantially and robustly affect B. I considered that against a few alternatives and on the, the slides that come later, um, I, uh, I considered some other objections. Um, I distinguished between the different modalities of power and I wanted to get you to focus on the difference between direct and mediated power. When it came to direct power, I wanted to really emphasize the fact that you can have power over someone in virtue of the fact that you can benefit them, as well as in the virtue of the fact that you can harm them. And I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that, um, you know, sometimes we need to pay, we need to focus on the dignitary dimension of harms and benefits, the ways in which a certain kind of action can express disrespect, um, as distinct from only focusing on how they affect people's um, physical well being. In the context of um, mediated power, I talked about altering options and altering attitudes. Um, I distinguished between obstructing and enabling, using normative commitments, penalties and inducements, menu choice and framing. Uh, in altering attitudes, I talked about desires and beliefs. Got a question from Sarah. Um, to what degree does culture influence the concept of power in different parts of the world? Could this affect how we see and handle power in AI? Um, I certainly think that there are different attitudes to power and different attitudes to, to what makes power legitimate. So it's kind of two parts of this question. One part is like, 
do we just have different ways of thinking about power entirely? Um, and certainly it's true that I've given you a particular view of the nature of power. And there are going to be disagreements about that that are um, indeed going to be um, ones that do, do vary to some um, significant degree. There's also questions about the normative reaction to power, you know, and, and what you might well find is that in different cultures, you may have different weights placed on justification versus legitimacy. Some people might ultimately say, look, I don't care whether you know, power is, is limited in any of these ways. What I want is just that it's done, used to do the right things. If it's used to do the right things, then that's fine. It doesn't matter to me any, any more than that. Um, and it's certainly possible that you might have sort of broadly speaking, more authoritarian susceptible cultures might take that kind of view. Um, although, you know, I'm inclined to think that a lot of those sort of supposedly cultural differences uh, are more a product of the fact that certain kinds of powerful agents have stayed in power over a long period of time in those places, rather than necessarily coming up from people, but that's a sort of anthropological speculation. Um, could it affect how we see and handle power in AI? Um, yeah, I mean, look, you've, you've got to sort of start from where you are and think about the, the, the applications that you're, that you're able to influence. Um, and in that context, I think you want to abide by the, the sort of the, the norms and standards in the places where the system's being used. Um, I do think that more generally the question of, you know, on the one hand, you're thinking about AI systems being deployed in the world by government, say, but on the other hand, there's the role that they played within our digital infrastructure. I think that kind of space is really interesting one because, you know, you don't have the territoriality um, of, the, of, the, of the community that it applies to sort of figure out what the relevant culture is. Um, is a challenge. So I then, I'm just gonna go back to my summary, but do chuck in any more questions in the last three minutes if you have them. Um, so I talked about governance. I, I like my definition of governance, the use of power to make, implement and enforce the constitutive rules of an institution. I think it's useful to distinguish between that and other kinds of power. Think about like, you know, the way in which a, a, a targeted ad kind of influences your beliefs and your preferences. That's a kind of power. It's not really a governance kind of power. Um, it's a different kind of thing. It's, it's trying to, broadly speaking, manipulate you for the sake of realizing a profit. It's worth distinguishing between that and the, what justifies that versus, um, you know, enforcing the constitutive rules um, of an institution, you know, stopping people from harming one another. All right, three minute call. Yeah, so Foucault. Um, so Ted Bedison, Associates Power and Philosophy of Foucault. Yeah, yeah. So um, I didn't name check him. Um, so I'm an analytical political philosopher. I don't um, uh, read a lot of Foucault, but when I talked about structural power, um, that slide was really the sort of my, my spin on the best version of Foucault. When Foucault talks about power, a lot of the time he's talking about power as being kind of imbued within, within all social relations in a way that is sort of not super informative. Um, because if it's everywhere, then it's kind of nowhere. That's a big, that's a big issue. Um, whereas the point I made about structure and the ways in which power kind of, uh, those structures have power over us, that I think is, you know, it's related to Foucault. I gave, an, I gave Sally Haslanger um, as, a, um, as a reference there. Okay, I won't go through the last things because I just did them. I'm not gonna go through the bonus content. Um, what I want you to see um, is, I wanna leave the slide up on the references because I'd like you to sort of, have access to the further reading. Um, it's gonna take a minute to click through. This is a lame way to end if I can't get there. Come on. Ah, okay. All right, so um, I would say, um, I would say very much uh, look at the Sally Haslanger um, book there, Ted. I think that's a sort of a best version of some of that idea. Um, big recommendation for the Hamilton an analysis and typology of social power. Um, if you want to think more about um, social structures, um, Catherine Ritchie is there. Um, and I uh, strongly recommend the Power Over and Power Two paper by Pamela Pensardi. Um, and I think I'm right out of time, uh, unable to respond to Mina Ilan's um, very interesting question on uh, law setting and law preserving violence. Sounds like a Bavarian distinction there. Um, have I reached my three minute call? Okay, well look, I'm gonna finish um, and say, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, thanks for paying attention. I don't know who's out there, but I know at least those of you who ask questions are, and I appreciate your, your attention wherever you are and whatever time it is um, where you are. Um, if anyone wants to follow up with me, um, just you know, find me at that uh, website at the bottom. Um, it's easy to get my email address.
um, and uh, I'd love to keep chatting with you. Um, Ryan, should I stop? I want to finish on a high note rather than in the middle of a sentence. Okay, I can keep going. All right, let me ask, answer this question. So Mina, um, reaching a normative consensus reinstates uh, constituent power violence. Um, I'm not sure I can answer the question, Mina. I think that um, normative consensus is uh, probably unattainable in many of these contexts. Um, I've been assuming in general, a kind of a view of politics that is aspirational in the sense that you, you, one thinks that it's possible to achieve something like a morally justified outcome. If you take a more kind of descriptive sociological view of power, you might just say that all you're gonna get is a certain balance of forces um, and there's no real sort of uh, way of evaluating it. It's always just gonna be a kind of a struggle for power. Um, and the best you might get is in a Weberian sense, kind of rational legal authority, where we just come to defer to an institution because it presents itself in a certain kind of way, but really there's nothing underneath it that justifies it. Um, that's, that's a completely reasonable view to take um, on the nature of power, that it is all ultimately a struggle and that it's sort of naive to think that power can be exercised legitimately. Um, I you know it's not a view that I take. I tend to think that um, even in the presence of normative disagreement, it's possible to, certainly it's possible to come up with better and worse ways to exercise power. And it's possible to have more and less limited power um, and failing anything kind of absolute. Um, I would be inclined to, to sort of go for a more limited power um, that is exercised in a better way. Um, and I think that we can realistically aim for that and we can aim for it both in our general institutions and in the way that we um, use and deploy and design and research um, artificial intelligence. So with that, I am gonna stop because that was a good finish, right?